The date was July 1936. One of the greatest sporting events in history, the Summer Olympics, was due to be held in Berlin, showcasing the best athletes nations of the world had to offer. It was understandably a big deal for any nation hosting the Games, a chance to show off the wealth and pride of their country, and more importantly, the quality of their athletes. But the German government of 1936 perhaps put more stock in this display than any other. The recent rise to power of the Nazi party had, to put it lightly, sent shockwaves throughout Europe. More than anything though, people were incredibly interested to see what Germany actually had to offer. And the Olympics was a chance for them to do just that. They were to show off the capital, the supposedly greatest nation on earth, and prove that superiority with the pure stock of German athletes. All over the city, anti-Jewish propaganda was ripped down by Nazi officials. Newspapers were censored, and visitors were protected from many of the new restrictive laws that had been introduced only a year earlier at Nuremberg. The aim of this was to impress the world with a nation that was both pure and strong, but also peaceful and tolerant. This was further backed by the inclusion of a Jewish fencer on the German team, despite many other Jews being barred. The infamous story of Jesse Owens winning gold medal after gold medal was only possible after international pressure pushed Germany to accept black and Jewish athletes. However, not everyone was happy with this state of affairs. On the best of days, the Olympics was seen by many on the left as a chauvinistic, Eurocentric white man's game. The presidents of the committees, namely Coburton and Latour, openly anti-Semitic, virulently racist, and the former strongly opposed women's participation in the Games. But the Olympics were certainly not the only mass sporting event in Europe. The International Workers' Olympiads were a series of events organised from the early 1920s onwards, seen as an alternative to the Olympics. In fact, even beating them sometimes in visitor and participation numbers, the Vienna Workers' Olympiad in 1931 altogether attracted nearly 400,000 athletes and visitors, to which the 1932 Summer Olympics in LA hailed. And the famous Spartacades, well they were the Soviet Union's response to the Olympics. Derived first from army sporting events, they quickly grew to somewhat international affairs. However, what is very important about these two events is, despite the claims some would make of the Spartacades, neither were actually supposed to be Olympics killers. At best, they were alternatives, and at worst, they were supplementary. The three events ran on completely different timetables, so why are we even here? Well, not everyone was pleased with this state. Many were increasingly unhappy with the fact that an openly fascist regime was going to hold games, and on the backdrop of a rapidly destabilizing political situation on home soil, the Spanish provincial Catalan government decided to host the first boycott games. The People's Olympiad was to run at the same time as the Berlin Olympics, and the organizers, they didn't hold back at all. It was born out of a failure to boycott the Berlin Games, a big danger to Hitler's dream had been a possible US withdrawal. See, usually the biggest contingent to the Games, the possibility of a US boycott would have just killed the Berlin Olympics. However, this boycott never materialized. The German acceptance of a token Jewish athlete and the scaling back of anti-Semitic rhetoric had somewhat placated the Jewish contingent, and the expected pushback from the black athletic community never really materialized. While a lot of leading athletes, like the welterweight Charlie Burley, decided to join in on the boycott, others, like Jesse Owens, had a slightly more nuanced view. The general position of many black athletes was one that recognised the hypocrisy of a nation in which lynchings were commonplace. Jim Crow laws and segregation were a part of daily life, and asking them to stay home for the reason another nation expressed those very same views was just downright insane to them. And in this, many had taken to prioritizing their sport. The US would go forth and compete in Berlin, but not all of them. And so the People's Olympiad was different. 
Jewish, black and Arab athletes were encouraged to compete. The poster for the Games placed their encouraged diversity front and centre. The US was encouraged to send black athletes. The aforementioned Charlie Burley, champion boxer, and Dorothy Tucker, a trade unionist and hurdler. Posters across the city of Barcelona proclaimed a Games full of sport and folklore. And the teams that assembled for the Games were not just national. While British, German, US and many other national teams had assembled, with the German team mostly being made up of exiled Jews and communists, there were also teams from nations that were colonised or didn't even exist. There was a team from Alsace and Algeria, representing themselves as opposed to France. There was a Catalan team, which had aspirations of independence. And there were also more general teams, such as a Jewish and Moroccan detachment. Due to the hasty nature of the events, athletes were posted in hostels, hotels and private accommodations all across the city. There was no time to construct an Olympic village and no money to do so, unlike what had happened in Berlin. A village that, by the way, would after the end of the Berlin Olympics, ominously host the men of the infamous Condor Legion for their departure for Spain. The German army detachment that would fight for the broad right coalition in the brewing Spanish Civil War. Barcelona and Spain itself was becoming a hotbed of political turmoil. There were the murmurings of a military coup, and the day before the games, on the 18th of July, cities in southern Spain had been captured by military forces loyal to the reactionary right. Even more worrying, fascist groups in the city of Barcelona itself had been discovered hoarding arms, and the army of Africa had rebelled. But as it was said, the games must go on. The Olympiade was a distinctly left-wing ordeal. A broad coalition of leftists, including anarchists, socialists, communists, and social democrats, had formed to support the Games. Most of the athletes were themselves part of these groups. This led to a curious case, in which many of the men and women of the Olympiade were also involved in the leftist reaction to the coup. Workers' unions and leftist parties were arming, ready to fight the rightist uprising. This included many members of the Games itself. One man, Max Friedman, a German exile, found himself organising the Games by day and taking part in unarmed workers' patrols at night, surveying for possible signs of a battle. On the night of the 18th, during a rehearsal concert for the Games, a messenger arrived. Both the Games and the concert were to be suspended. A bloody coup was imminent in Barcelona itself, but the old conductor of the orchestra was not to be deterred. He halted the evacuation and insisted one last song to be played, Beethoven's Ode to Joy. But elsewhere in the city, tensions were somewhat lower. Many expected the coup to amount to nothing, as many before it had in the tumultuous politics of Spain. Athletes drank and partied on the night before the games, claiming that Barcelona was the only city left in Europe with a decent nightlife. Although many of the athletes had seen such ignorance before. Our German friend Friedman from earlier, along with a team of like-minded exiles from Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland and Germany, had spent the day before visiting hunting shops all over the city, stocking up on shotguns and one pistol. 4am, the morning of the 19th. The day the games was set to begin, a myriad of noises woke athletes across the city. Some believed it to be signifying the opening of the games, but they were perhaps too optimistic. It was in fact the beginning of the Battle of Barcelona, one of the first in the Civil War. Rebel forces had risen up suddenly, countered by heavily armed trade unions and loyal police contingents. And thus ends the story of the games. They never materialised, and the dream of an event free from discrimination of all kinds wouldn't be realized for decades yet. But for the story of our athletes, it was far from over. Owing mostly to their inherently leftist background, many of the competitors for the games became the first warriors of a creed that would define the war, the international volunteers. Of the exiles from the fascist nations, such as the Germans and Italians, they knew that they must fight where they stood lest Spain fall to the same fate their own nations had. And when they left, 
many would find themselves returning weeks, months, or years later to fight as part of the organized international brigades, militias who fought for the Spanish Republic. But for the first frantic days, many athletes played a role in the fighting to come. Friedman noted the corpses littering the streets as he found his way to the communist headquarters to arm himself with something more substantial. He was turned away and told to scavenge his own weaponry, as many others would now have to do. All pretensions of the games had left his mind. He was part of a war now. Fanny Schoenheit, another athlete, joined a motley crew of fighters, stealing her own weapon. And she wasn't the only one. An American was seen building barricades for the Republicans. An Austrian athlete had fallen in the fighting, and according to a French sprinter, Cassar, three more had also died. But for the most part, the athletes were turned away in their attempts to help in the rapidly escalating conflict. It was not their war. At least, not yet. And indeed, when it was time to leave, not everyone did. Some refused to board the boats, instead joining the group of exiles that had armed themselves at the hunting stores, staying to fight. And so, that concludes the story of the People's Olympiad, a failed movement, nonetheless an admittingly inspiring one. Disregarding any personal political beliefs, it should be instantly recognisable to all the merit in what they had planned. In the glimmer of hope that had been provided to the political exiles of Europe, many of which came together to take part in the games, and many of which would lose their lives fighting in a war which they made their own. And as for the untold thousands who would join them in the following months as part of the international brigades, well their story, it'll have to wait. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. The support in my last video was immense, and it was my first ever video to get over 1,000 views. Thank you all very much, and until next time, goodbye.